Hello, good afternoon, and a very warm welcome to this live employer masterclass from the Change in Education Group. My name is Amos Madri, your host and career advisor here at the Change in Education Group. This is an opportunity for employers to give you, the students, a real insight into their world of work. Joining me today is Sarah Townsend, who's a freelance copywriter and author of the number one Amazon bestseller, Survival Skills for Freelancers. Described as better than a business coach, the handbook to self-employment distills 20 years of freelance experience, plus quotes from over 100 freelancers into 200 unputtable, (laughs) unputted downable pages, if we can get my words out. And believe you me, I was one of those. It's an incredible book. Uh, It's so much to take from it. Uh, Since writing the book, Sarah has combined her copywriting work with delivering mentoring, training and events to help the self-employed community tackle the ups and downs of freelance life. Indeed, Sarah, that book is un put it down a ball if I can get my word out (laughs) but it's incredible you know um I was just saying to you before we came on air you know um there's a lot of questions that you answer in that book you know there's questions that we all think about and you know we wonder is it just me you know Mm. thinking like that but you actually you know go there (laughs) you answer those questions so it it was nice to see that, you know, you addressed a lot of issues and a lot of uh, questions that we all ask ourselves, whether Mm. you're a freelancer or whether you're uh, employed. And, you know, again, the topics that you cover, you know, it ranges, you know, from that imposter syndrome to, uh, you know, uh, say no. It's hard to say no sometimes, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, You know, there's just so many areas that you do cover. Uh, and it was an absolute joy just to read that book. And uh, yes, definitely a number one bestseller. So Sarah, tell us a little bit about yourself and how the past year has been for you. Oh, the past year has been absolutely mad. So uh, yeah, as you said in your intro, um, Amos, I've spent the past 22 years working for myself. And before that, I know I don't look old enough, right? Oh. Um, before that, I worked client side and agency side. So I've experienced all the different areas of work. And um, so I was doing that for 22 years. And before um well really before COVID kicked in last year at the start of the year I just suddenly thought I went from being somebody who said that they'd never write a book to do you know what I've got this book inside me and it needs to come out um and the reason being that I just think everybody was ready for a real reality check um into what self-employment is actually like and the, the thing that you touched on earlier on just there is the fact that the advice within the book doesn't just relate if you're self-employed. It's human stuff, isn't it? It's it definitely how these like mental blocks, how we get in our own way with things like negative self-talk and self-doubt and lack of confidence. And it's the stuff that's in here. So it's not a business book in the traditional sense, as I'm sure you'll agree. It's not talking about how to create a business plan or how to um, how to implement a streamlined procedure. It's not that kind of book. It's like a chat with a friend. Yeah. Just happens to be a friend who's been there and done it and made all the mistakes herself so that you don't have to. So that's kind of that was kind of my intention. But yeah, I I literally thought I would write the book, publish the book, go back to the day job. But if that was the case, I wouldn't be here today talking to you. So instead, I found myself, as you said in the intro, doing mentoring um, for a group of 10 women on the Freelance Hair 100 project. I've done almost 50 podcast interviews, over 50 live events. I've been doing training for university students on the reality of freelancing versus the expectation and how to deal with those challenges. Um, so if anybody out there watching is at university, feel free to tell your lecturers because it's such a popular webinar. Um, and yeah, it's just really changed things for me. I'm still doing the copywriting, but I'm juggling it with all these extra things that I never had the confidence to do before. Yeah, I think, you know, again, you've um, touched on so many different things there. 
And I think for me, this book, well, what it does is it helps you to navigate through life, through the the, the world of employment, Mm -hmm. um, how to um, figure out who you are. Because I think sometimes, you know, when you're in education, you've always got that support in hand. You've always got the teachers there. You've always got people there to support you and help you to plan for the future. But once you go into the world of work, or once you go into self-employment or freelance work, um, you know, it's difficult because that same support is not always there. But I suppose this book does that. And you had a really difficult start because when you went to your careers advisor, they weren't really helpful. In fact, they um, they implored you to uh, go to university because of the good yeah. grades that you were getting. But you believed that, you know, going into uh, work was the right thing for you. Tell us a little bit about that, because a lot yeah. of our students, our audience, are at that stage where they're thinking about, should I go to university or perhaps employment? Yeah, I can very much relate. I have an 18-year-old son who's going through the same thing, just finished his A-levels. Um, so, yeah, I was fairly sure just from early days that I didn't want to go to university. I got the grades that I could have gone, but I just didn't want that. I wanted to go and get my independence in a different way. I wanted to be earning money and developing my skills and my experience. Um, So I just went out and uh, applied for a couple of jobs and got offered them both, Um, spoilt for choice. But at the same time, yeah, the careers advisor, the head of the sixth form, the head of the school, they pulled me into their office and they said, look, it's a waste of your education. If you don't go to university, if you start university now, um, you in three years time, you'll be earning £10,000 more. And I was kind of like, yeah, but debt plus three years of not earning I really just wanted to go out there and start learning but real life skills so if anybody out there is considering doing that and has you know I know things are very different now this was a very long time ago but it is entirely possible to have a successful freelance or self-employed career without a degree I'm proof of that Definitely. I think you, you you clearly proved that. And I think, again, you know, going back to uh, that early stage when um, you, you started with your first job, your enthusiasm and you're willing to work hard. I think, you know, they, they, they were able to see that and they, they thought, you know, there's something here. There's something special, um, you know, with, with what we've got here. And mm-hmm. they put you as an ambassador uh, for, for the company, which opened ultimately more doors for you, gave you the confidence to go into more senior positions. And of course, when you uh, even switch to another company later on, you were still able to uh, go into um, more senior positions because of that, uh, Mm. you know, those skills of, uh, those soft skills, uh, I'd say. Could you talk to us a a bit about that? So important. I think there's often with a lot of schools and a lot of educators, there's a lot of a focus on being the best academically but there's not enough focus on who you are as a person and personally I think I am slightly biased because I didn't go down the uni route but I think getting real life experience but more than that showing initiative being keen to learn being open to new challenges being curious All of those skills, as you say, I just think tenacity is underrated. So kind of that sticking, you know, really you decide you want something, stick at it. Don't be flaky. Don't kind of drop out as soon as a challenge hits, because it's actually by going through those challenges that that is how we learn and grow as individuals. And then ultimately, when you get to my age as business owners, So, um, yeah, focus really on being the sort of person that is going to be an asset to someone's team, that you're going to be someone who really people love working with because they contribute, they show initiative, they have a, a fun side. You know, you have to take work seriously, of course, but you don't. Being professional these days doesn't mean wearing a suit and being very serious and only talking about business. It's all about being a human being who is adding something to an organization or a business. What can you bring to the table? Yeah, definitely. I think you've made a really good good point there. And it's, um, you know, uh, expressing those skills that you've already got, you know, 
Uh, it might be that you're empathetic, you're caring, um, you're good at listening to people. And these are things that you do at home and your family might say that about you. Uh, and you might not think that those are valuable, but in mm. fact, those are the very skills that get you further. Yeah. And, you know, again, you've uh, eloquently just touched on that there. How can our audience identify these skills and how can they uh, improve on those skills as well? Um, well, something that I share at the start of Survival Skills for Freelancers is that it is really important to get to know yourself. Um, and, and really, I say that in the context of if you're thinking of going freelance, but really, it's important for anybody, whatever route into your career you decide to take, because by being aware of the things that you think, oh, that's a weakness, I'm rubbish at that. If you can spend some kind of real soul searching time, maybe just with a physical piece of paper in front of you and write down a list of what people say. It's not always things exactly as you identified there, Amos. It's not always things that you can see in yourself. And if you ask people who know you well, actually just say, what three words would you use to describe me? The chances are they'll come up with qualities and characteristics that you haven't even thought you possessed. So that is really important. But it's equally important to be aware of what you would consider to be your weaknesses, because you can often flip your weaknesses on their head and reframe them as being a strength. So to give you a real life example, and I talk about this in the book as well, go into more detail in actual fact, I am really impatient. I am not someone who has any patience for anything other than if I'm taking a photo and I'm waiting for people to get out the way. But literally in my career, in business, in my life, in being a mum, I hate waiting. So you could kind of go, oh yeah, that's a real, you know, we'll try and bury that because that's really not a good quality to have. But on the flip side, turn that into a positive I'm someone who's really driven I make things happen. I wrote a book in six weeks, you know, and it's become a bestseller. I did all the publicity, all the marketing. So I'm really driven to do the things that I know are going to kind of fulfill me in my career and in my life. And actually by being quite an immediate person. So if I think, oh, oh, you know, I should really connect with that person on social media or on LinkedIn or whatever, um, I don't know how many of you, if any, have actually thought about even putting up a profile on LinkedIn, but it is really helpful whatever you decide to do in your career. But actually, if I think I want to connect with somebody, I'm not going to wait. I'm not going to add it to a to-do list. I'm just going to do it now. So having that kind of driven determination, that's the flip side of being impatient. So have a think about some of the things that you could think other people could go, oh, you know, you're not um, you're not good at paying attention necessarily. Well, perhaps that means you've got a million things going on inside your brain at any one time, which is very much like me. And in actual fact, if you can tune into that and you can learn to harness that as a strength and a skill, that's going to stand you in such good stead. So um, there are a number of personality tests that I share in the book, as Amos knows. And um, I always say that if you are going to be working for yourself or by yourself, you really need to get to know yourself better. Whatever you decide to do in your career and in your life, that is good advice. So um, look up the personality tests. The Myers-Briggs is a really famous one. It's on the internet as 16personalities.com. Yeah, I believe we offer that as well as uh, part of the uh, work experience. Perfect, fantastic! Yeah. It's so insightful, and it'll really give you an eye-opening view on what your own strengths and weaknesses are. And when you know what your weaknesses are, or the things that you need to work on, that's precisely it. You've identified those areas that perhaps you're not as strong as you would like to be, but that's a gift. Knowing that is a gift. Going through life being oblivious to what your weaknesses are is a whole different story. But when you know what they are, then you can address them. Then you can learn new skills, new ways of doing things that really tackle those 
challenges, I guess. And it also helps to kind of flag you up to the sorts of things that you're likely to find challenging throughout your life and your career. For example, I'm a really sensitive person, like highly sensitive. And um, everybody said to me when I started working for myself, you have to have thick skin. And I did a poll on Twitter when I first started saying, to be a successful freelancer, you need dot, dot, dot. And so many people responded. We're talking in the hundreds. And the number of times people said, you need to be thick skinned. And I thought, well, I'm not. And I've never let it, never let it hold me back. So being aware is really helpful because you can address. I like that. Self-awareness and just being true to who you are. Yeah. You know, and I like what you said that, uh, that, you know, just do it now. I think it was W. Clement Stone that says, uh, if you see something, just do it now. Just do it quickly. Do it now. So really important to uh, be prompt in uh, your actions uh, so that then at least it's done. Um, Can I share another really useful quote on that basis just very quickly? So Richard Branson said something that also kind of relates because when we realize that we've got this weakness or this area that we're not as good at, quite often we'll get in our own way and we'll stop ourselves from taking those opportunities that are going to develop us as a person and develop our career. So when you're offered an opportunity, if someone offers you an amazing opportunity and you don't know how to do it, say yes, and then learn how to do it after. And I think that is such a positive quote to keep in mind because it's only really often by going outside your comfort zone and doing that presentation or applying for a promotion or going for that job that feels like a leap of faith. When you do those things and you step out of your comfort zone, that's when you get the growth in confidence. It's such a boost. Yes, definitely. Challenge yourself. Um, I'll tell you what, you've challenged yourself by doing so many different things today, uh, as well as uh, just finishing off uh, a live LinkedIn session and you've come straight here. How do you fit everything in? Um, That's probably the the biggest challenge of my life right now because um, I'm still doing the copywriting because that's the work that I love and I love helping business owners with new website copy and to kind of identify the things that make their business special and to communicate them in a clear and concise way and that's what a copywriter does. But now I've also got this passion for spreading this message and helping particularly young people because my kids are 22 and 18 and it feels like I'm putting something back into the world. So the first 10 years of being freelance, I was rubbish at it. So this is why I wanted to share the advice in the book so other people didn't have to go through that 10 year teething process. But actually now I'm wanting to do things like this I'm wanting to do more of the talks and the speaking and the same difference Um, the webinars and the events and the podcast chats because all of that is spreading the word and helping people so um, yeah it's very difficult to juggle also since um, I turned 50 two years ago I've not worked Fridays (laughs) <laughs> and I only have four days to fit everything in. So now on Fridays, I do other things. So, um, yeah, fitting everything in is a challenge. Yeah. Wow. Incredible. Um, you, you, again, you know, talked about sometimes the things that you're not so good at. Uh, in your book, you talk about outsourcing, uh, yeah. which is really good advice. Uh, sometimes, you know, it's, it can be, if you know you're not good at something, just outsource it to Get somebody it. else. Yeah. Uh, Could you talk to us about the outsourcing process? And then also another interesting thing that you spoke about was flow. And I think being in flow is such an important thing. And how do you get into that rhythm and uh, how do you stay there? Yeah. Um, So two very different questions there. I'll tackle the first one first. So um, if anybody isn't familiar with what outsourcing is, it's when you're running a business and you have other things that need doing, which aren't your special skill. So say, for example, you become a self-employed graphic designer. You want to spend as much of your day and of your time doing graphic design and getting paid good money for doing that thing that fulfills you. But what you quickly learn when you're running your own business is that you'll get to the end of the week and you'll think, Oh God, I've only spent 50% of my time actually doing the work that I'm getting paid for, which is the thing that I enjoy. And the reason I went into business in the first place. 
what you're doing with the rest of your time is things like um, finding clients, putting yourself out there on social media, building your online presence, marketing your business, um, doing proposals to get the work in, chasing your payments from, from your accounts, physically doing your accounts at the end of the year, fixing your computer, all those things additional skills that we're expected to have as business owners, but actually we've never received any training on how to do those things. And they can really trip you up if you're not careful. So what I always say is take time to write a list of all the tasks that you do in a regular week that are not the thing that you went into business to do. So if you're a graphic designer, everything that's not graphic design, me as a copywriter, everything that's not copywriting, write them on a list and then um, mark them out of five and give a one to the things that you're really not good at and B, you really don't enjoy. And the things that score the lowest are therefore the tasks that when you have a regular income and you've got money to spare, you can actually think of switching those tasks over to somebody who is an expert at doing those things. So what that actually does, it gets rid of the things that A, you don't enjoy, B, you're not good at, and C, that they're not making you money. You're getting rid of those tasks. You're freeing yourself up so much time and headspace to focus on doing the thing that you love that does make you money. And at the same time, you're equipping your business with this, t- ch- this can't say it, a team of cheerleaders who are effectively all working for the success of your business. And they're using their expertise, their skills and their experience on your behalf. And to be perfectly honest, I think the reason that this gets in the way for a lot of people is because we go into business to make money for ourselves and the idea of spending it on something, someone else to do something that we can do. We just hate doing it. It's kind of inconceivable because you're like, well, I'm earning, you know, a thousand pounds. Why do I want to spend 200 pounds? But proportionally, the time that you're saving, because if I think, okay, it's going to take me 10 hours to do my accounts for the sake of argument, I might just assume that if it's going to cost me, if it's going to take me 10 hours, it's going to, I'm going to have to pay someone 10 hours to do that work. But what you need to remember is that the person you're outsourcing to is an expert. They do this day in, day out. This is their special skill. So what takes you 10 hours may only take them two So you're freeing up all that extra time for yourself and you're only having to pay someone for two hours of work or four hours of work or whatever it is. But chances are it's never going to take someone as long as it takes you because you don't know what you're doing and you don't enjoy it. Yeah, excellent advice. And then the other thing was getting into flow. Yes, thank you. Um, Yeah, so I think getting into flow is really hard, but I am somebody who has um, what my partner calls a butterfly brain. So I've always got a million things going on. And because I'm such an immediate person, I always want to just do them now. So for me, at the start of the year, particularly when we'd gone through COVID, I just decided that one of the things I really love doing is reading And I really was not making enough time, in fact, really barely any time to read, apart from when I was on holiday. So I decided to make a really small habit shift that's made a big, big difference to my life. So now at the start of every day, what I would do was pick up my phone, turn off my alarm and go straight into social media. I don't want to do that. I don't want to be kind of getting sucked into scrolling unintentionally as soon as I've woken up. So instead, I now pick up my book, I read for half an hour, and I do the same at the end of the day to keep me off my screen. Sometimes I have to literally put the phone outside the room because I'll be suddenly thinking, oh, I'm just going to, I'm just going to message this person. I'm just going to follow this person. I'm just going to follow up with this. But if the phone is out of sight and I'm reading for half an hour, that's just brilliant because it's escapism. 
it puts you in a state of flow. I'm not saying reading has to be the thing for you. Flow might be found differently. It might be um, swimming, I think is another good one. That's another one for me. Um, it might be, um, you might be good at art. It might be drawing. It might be creating music. There's two things that my son does a lot of. Um, it's really finding that activity that really you can lose yourself in. Um, a lot of older people, it's, gar- I don't know why I said older people. It's not just older people who like gardening, but, you know, walking the dog across fields without your phone, not, you know, just getting lost in nature, whatever it is for you. But the upshot of my small habit change is that I am now on the 32nd book of 2021. And last year, I reckon I read no more than five or six books. So it's a tiny change. It gave me escapism from all the reality of COVID and everything going on in the world, gave me my flow state in which I can just lose myself in activity. And um, and it's meant that I've read 31 books. A voracious reader. Absolutely. <laughs> Never was before. Wow. Um, can you get into flow in work? Can I personally, anyone. can yeah. anyone, what yeah. I do, I, I, I do all the time. I have this, um, um, I think I'm a little bit um, ADD because I um, have this kind of hyper-focus, this state of hyper-focus. Sometimes, I'm not going to lie, sometimes it takes me ages to get into the state of focus. Um, I share a lot of productivity tips in the book on kind of really how to avoid procrastination and just get on with the thing that you have to do. But once I get into that state of say I'm writing a website for someone, nothing is going to distract me. So um, my kind of second office, as I call it, is the lounge bar at my gym. So I take my laptop, I'll go for a swim first thing. When I've done my exercise, I've had my endorphins boost. um, I've got the exercise, kind of the good, happy hormones running through me. And then I go and sit back at my laptop and then I'm focused, I'm productive and I start cracking on with writing this copy. And then someone will come over and they'll have been standing there. They have to literally tap me on the shoulder and go, hey, (laughs) they'll be standing there waiting to chat to me. And I go, oh, God, it made me jump out of my skin. And um, and I won't have noticed that they were even there. So, yeah, it's entirely possible to find a flow state in work. Just have to be doing something, I think, that is in line with what you love. Definitely. And again, in your book, you know, you were talking about um, the concepts of working hard versus working smart. Mm. Uh, could you talk to us a little bit about that? Um, Yeah, that's kind of in the summary, isn't it? At the end, it's things like, are you smart enough to ask for help with the things that you don't enjoy? Like we're talking about the the outsourcing. Are you smart enough to kind of appreciate the value of community and connection, particularly when you're working on your own? We all need that community around us, however introverted you are, however self-reliant you are. I'm very self-reliant and very independent, but I still really need that community around me because we get the support and the advice and the help from those people who are doing a similar job to us or have similar experience to us. Everybody has different perspectives. Um, Can you be smart enough to treat, this is one thing that I talk about a lot, treat your freelance business as a business, not to go, oh, I'm just a freelancer because quite a lot of us will go, Oh, yeah, you know, I'm just I'm just doing a bit of freelancing on the side to make a bit of extra money. But actually, if you don't take your business seriously, why on earth would your clients? They wouldn't because they can pick up on the fact that you're just doing little bits on the side. When you start to take your business seriously and you start to operate with the mindset of a business owner, again, a whole chapter on this, um, it's it makes all the difference because it starts to attract clients who want to work with you as like a partner instead of they're up here being the um the client and you're down there as kind of the lowly supplier i don't want relationships in my business that are based on that i want to work with people who respect and trust me and appreciate and uh, um 
uh, just just kind of admire, I guess, what I bring to the table and how I help their business, how I'm an asset to their business is kind of almost an extension of their team. So when you start to kind of make those steps and make those changes, start to treat your business as a business, that's when the magic happens and you really will like notice the difference. That's when the magic happens. <laughs> I like it. So um, I noticed we're quickly coming towards the end of our uh, chat here today. What final words would you like to leave our audience with? Oh, gosh. Um, yeah, that's a big question. I would say whatever you want to do, learn from people who have already been there and done it. Because if you find the right people, a lot of people will be very generous with their advice. You can learn from the challenges that they've been through. The whole of um, Survival Skills for Freelancers is all about me sharing the mistakes that I've made so that other people don't have to. So um, really kind of open your eyes to the power of connection. Keep an open mind. Stay curious. Um, yeah, that, that's quite a lot of things. Sorry, but all basically kind of revolving around just just keep an open mind. I think stay curious is probably the one thing that I would say if I had to sum it up, because um, you never know who you're talking to. You know, it's really easy for us to judge other people and to kind of go to know, I don't think that person is going to help me in my business. Don't be judgmental because you just never know. I mean, for starters, we can never judge on, ex on um, appearances anyway. We never should judge on appearances. You don't know what that person's been through. You don't know what challenges they've faced, what they've come through, what they've learned, what they could share with you. But more than that, you don't know who they're related to. You don't know who they're married to. You don't know who they go to the pub with or go to the gym with. So all those connections, it's like a ripple effect. So treat everyone with the same amount of respect wherever you meet them. Is that okay? That is huge advice. That is so important. <laughs> it is uh, incredible advice. You, you don't know who uh, you're talking to when yeah. you treat everybody with respect. You know, uh, someone once said, uh, you know, I treat the janitor uh, with the same respect as uh, I treat the CEO. Yeah. Um, you know, and, and it's that important because sometimes it's the janitor who will broker that deal for you and get you into those positions. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, for our audience, I think that is vitally important. I think that's a big takeaway from today. Uh, treat everybody with respect and mm -hmm. you just don't know who you're going to come into contact with. Mm -hmm. And that person who you might have thought was a nobody yeah. might actually have a major role to play in your future. Yeah. Uh, so it's vitally important that we really take that on board. Uh, Sarah, you've shared a lot of great wisdom with us here today. Uh, I think there's so much that's been said. I, I always tell our audience, you know, watch this over and over again. And I think it's so important that you do this, uh, especially with this interview here today, because what you've shared with us is incredible insight, not just into the world of a freelancer, because I think you go far beyond this. Mm. Uh, it's, it's more, it's life skills. It's yeah. how to survive out there when you're in the working world. And Absolutely. you're trying to find out who you are, uh, trying to figure out, you know, what is this whole uh, career about? What's wh Where am I going? What does this mean? Mm. And, you know, you answer a lot of those uh, questions, uh, burning questions, which I'm sure our audience uh, wants to know more about. In fact, can you tell us where we can find more about your book? Um, okay, so it is on sale on Amazon, on paperback, Kindle, and as of last week, also audiobook. So you can find it on iTunes and on Audible. Um, if anybody is boycotting Amazon and would like to buy a copy, just drop me a DM, explain that you found me through, um, through Amos, and I'll gladly sell you a copy direct. I always have plenty of copies in my home ready to send out. But if anybody wants to connect with me, please do make sure that you um, send a little personalized note and just say where you found me because I do do a lot of events and talks. I'm always more likely to connect with someone or to accept a connection request if I know where you've come from and what you found most helpful about the talk. Um, the Probably the best place to actually find me is to go to survivalskillsforfreelancers.com. 
because that is the, the the book's website, as it were. It links to my copywriting website if you'd like to know more about what a copywriter does. It also links to my social media. So you can find me on LinkedIn, Instagram, and Twitter, mainly. And it also links to my email address. Um, but definitely try to connect with me um, somewhere on social media and let me know that you've watched and you found it helpful. I'd really appreciate that. Excellent. And good luck to you all, whatever you do end up doing. Fantastic. Sarah, thank you so much for spending uh, this afternoon with us and your busy schedule. It's been an absolute joy just having you here, listening to uh, your words of wisdom, giving us knowledge and understanding and helping us uh, through uh, life, navigating our way around uh, with your experiences. So from all the team here at the Changing Education Group, thank you to all our audience. And for those of you who've uh, stayed up late in Dubai to make sure uh, you catch this, it's been great having you guys on board. Thank you so much for taking part in this week of virtual work experience. So from myself, from Sarah, from all the team here at the Changing Education Group, thank you very much. Take care. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you.